to so I am going to um, re recite the uh, hadith that we're going to be discussing and um, then get into the discussion, inshallah. So Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Allahumma salli ala sallam ala Sayyidina Muhammad al Fatihah ibn Awlaka al Khatimi liman sabaqa nasiri al-haqqi bi haqqi wa al-hadi wa sirat al-mustaqim wa ala alihi haqqa qadrihi wa maqdara al-azim rabbi shahri sadri wa sallli amri wa fahri wa ahdir aqda min lisani yafqa al-qawla. Actions are according to intentions, and everyone will get what was intended. Whoever migrates with an intention for Allah and his messenger, the migration will be for the sake of Allah and his messenger. And whoever migrates for worldly gain or to marry a woman, then his migration will be for the sake of whatever he migrated for. Related by Bukhari and Muslim. So some of the context of this hadith is it's seen as a very central to Islamic thought. Um, in fact, I think it is one of the kind of differentiating factors between um, between the focus in Islam compared to other faith groups. Um, there's this really strong focus on intentions and that shows up in our culture a lot uh, and between the internal and external states. So why is it important? Why are intentions well, before we jump into that, I wanted to just like break down this specific hadith a little bit more mm -hmm. about migration and give it context of like, what is migration referring to and um, how is this applicable to us? So this uh, hadith was relayed at a time where the Muslims were migrating from Mecca to Medina and um, they were many, and it wasn't easy to migrate because these people were being persecuted. Um, and to strengthen the ummah, they were all going to one central location where they could all be safe and to practice their religion uh, in peace. But some people were not migrating for the right reasons. And so that's why the Hadith mentions, um, whoever migrates for worldly gain or to marry a woman, then his migration will be for the sake of whatever he migrated for. So many people would migrate for the sake of marriage, like there's someone there that they could marry or there's like some worldly gain um, to, to go to this place. And the, the intention wasn't for Allah and his messenger. Is this the first of Nawawi's? This is the first of the yeah. 40 hadith in Nawawi. And so what, what I explained last week was Imam Nawawi is a very prominent Shafi scholars and many scholars have compiled 40 hadith um, compilations in the past, uh, but this one has become the most well-known and prominent of them. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, my understanding of it is that it's super central to our Islamic philosophy. Um, and the reason why uh, is because it talks about something that is kind of metaphysical, which is your inner reality versus your outer reality and a focus on aligning them. And I think it's really interesting to see how that plays into modern understandings of mental health and this need for authenticity that you might be hearing, this word in our culture that's really been focused on now. What does it mean to be authentic? Um, and I just wanted to give a bit of context about kind of why I see this as super crucial right now. So we live in a, a results data-driven world that is uh, very focused on outcomes, very focused on results. We have a Forbes list 30 under 30 of people who have achieved all of these amazing accomplishments. And um, we hear unto no end of uh, amazing people who have done amazing things. And there's this assumption in that of, or well, the question is always, what do you do? And if you, if you introduce yourself in a professional environment, often that's the focus. What have you done? Tell us something you've done. The question is very, is rarely, why did you do it? Mm -hmm. And that actually, that manifests in our culture a lot. What have you done? How much of it have you done? Exactly. How fast did you do it? It's not why. Um, I actually had a, had a job interview um, a year ago and in the interview, um, I asked the CEO about some of the values of the company because part of, part of our work culture these days is about having values in your corporate environments. 
people are realizing you can't bring people together and have them actually do what you want them to do without instilling some type of culture in that. So uh, they had some various values in the in the company, and I asked CEO, "Why is this particular value important to you?" He was stumped. And I was like, you've, "You're the founder and the CEO. You sell up this company, and you can't tell me why it's important to you." And that's when I kind of realized this is a tick box value. This is something that is, it, it sounds nice and it feels good to hear, but if you don't know why it's an important value to you individually as the leader of a company, then you have to really think there's something kind of messed up about that. Um, I later found out some horrible things about that company. <laughs> I won't, won't go into that. So. There's this... I, think, I think it speaks to like the horrible things that you found out that the company mm -hmm. speaks to where the leaders intentions were mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. the end result wasn't the people it wasn't you know um, these values of integrity that everybody sees as universal values it was about something else it was about this mass output without clear intention and maybe there is an intention there and the intention could have been something like status wealth power Mm. Yeah, and I think that's that's kind of leads nicely into this next point about we like a lot of companies and a lot of organizations, a lot of groups start and come together. And rarely the question is, why did you start the company? The, the question is normally it, it's just an assumption that it's, it's fine. Like, <laughs> and that leads us to like convenience, like this focus in our culture, especially in technology these days of convenience. And one of the greatest empires right now in that is a uh, um, very confused brother, Jeff Bezos, um, who, where it's never really asked why is convenience important? It's never really, it's just a given. Like, yeah, we need things to be done quicker and faster and we need to grow. Like, and we need to grow. <laughs> and there's no end. Why? And where are we going? And when do you know you've grown enough? Yeah. So all of these kind of larger questions are not asked. And I think that's why it's kind of antithetical to Islamic values, because those questions have to be asked. Because if you don't have the why, and if your why isn't tied to something, tied to something constant or something beyond yourself, then that why, uh, then the fruits of whatever your labor is will inevitably be kind of harmful. And how you go about doing that then becomes an issue. It becomes an issue of um, the, the ends justifying the means um, rather than thinking intentionally across each step along the way. I would also add that outside of just groups and organizations and technology, I would say that this very much is an individual pursuit because when groups come together, groups are cons consistent of individuals. Um, and that's why I think, you know, the leaders in this, if they are not asking and questioning their own intentions within themselves, it ends up trickling down and influencing everybody else uh, vicariously and subconsciously. Mm -hmm. A lot of people say that you just need to look to the leader to understand why the company is, how the company is, or what the issues the company is facing, uh, because you'll find the same amounts of anxiety being trickled down, you'll find the same amounts of um, complete just anxiousness spread across the organization. And you'll find on an individual level, we as individuals, no one is immune to this, but we all fall into groupthink when we're in a group mm -hmm. within each other. And if we're not constantly revisiting our own intentions, it's very easy to get lost into the values of whatever the groupthink is and not really think for yourself why you're doing what you're doing, mm -hmm. which can get dangerous for your own self-preservation and for future progenies. As you can tell we had a stressful week at work. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so yeah, one thing to bear in mind from this hadith of um, actions are but by intentions and this focus on your intention uh, is intentions are not static. They're not something you can just make once. You know, yeah, it's something that is consistently changing and it's something that needs to be revisited. Um, they're also not singular. They tend to be, they're, they're rarely singular. They tend to be very multifaceted. Your intentions can incorporate all manner of things. 
and being aware of that is is the game is yeah part yeah. of it. And you may begin with actually something that's a very noble intention that starts to mutate into something that wasn't that's not so noble anymore. And we know many people who have started off with a, a vision of, you know, helping other people, for example. But then slowly it becomes about all like, you know, then they become extremely successful. Allah carried that beautiful intention forward and made it made manifest a beautiful, successful vision. But then that person may have become lost in that vision and that popularity or the wealth or whatever that could have come from that intention. And then that intention kind of starts fading into the background and mutates into something else. Um, and I wanted to share another hadith related to this. Um, um, where is it? Okay, so. Well, the picture on this website is horrible. The picture of fire, like the hellfire. <laughs> but anyway, the point is <laughs> of what someone's interpretation of hellfire is. Um, so, the first, okay, so the first of people, this is the Rasulullah on the authority of Abu Dayda. Um, the first of people against whom judgment will be pronounced on the day of resurrection will be a man who died a martyr. He will be brought and Allah will make known to him his favors and he will recognize them. Recognize them. Allah will say, and what did you do about them? He will say, I fought for you and until I died as a martyr. And Allah will say, you have lied. You did but fight that it might be said of you, he is courageous. And so it was said, then he will be ordered to be dragged along on his face until he's cast into the hellfire. The second one is to go to hellfire is the scholar, a man who has studied religious knowledge and has taught and used it to and was and used it to recite the Quran. He will be brought and Allah will make it known to him his favors and he will recognize them. Allah will say, what did you do about them? He will say, I studied knowledge and I taught and I recited the Quran for your sake. He will say, you have lied. You did but study religious knowledge that it might be said of you, he is learned. And you recited the Quran that it might be said of you, he is a reciter. And so it was said, then he'll be ordered to be dragged along his faith until he's cast into the hellfire. Another will be a man whom Allah has made wealthy and whom he had given all kinds of riches. He will be brought and Allah will make known to him his favors and he will recognize them. Allah will say, what did you do about them? He will say, I left no path untrodden in which you like money to be spent without spending it for your sake. He will say, you have lied. You did but do so that it might be said of you, he is open-handed. And so it was said, then he will be ordered to be dragged along his face until he's cast into the hellfire. Um, That's a heavy one. Mm -hmm. It's a really heavy one. And when the, when the, the companions of the Prophet heard this, it started off the, the hadith was that the, the, the people who will enter hellfire, like the scholar, the reciter, the um, and the wealthy person. Um, and well, the first one, what was the first one? The martyr. martyr. The martyr. 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 And the Sahaba were like, the companions were like, those are really noble people. Why would they be the ones to go to hellfire? But this is the magnitude of and the weight of intentions that you can do something so noble, but if it's not for the sake of God, if it's for the sake of your own, that people will say things about you that, oh, look, I'm so charitable. And like, you know, I, I donate so much here and um, look at me like I'm a, a hero, a war hero, or, you know, um, look at me like I'm, I'm such a learned scholar and I know so much and people love to listen to me. Really was your intention for Allah. And one of the, we were talking about forgiveness last week and um, the scholars all agree that one of the only, the only um, sin that is not forgivable is shirk. Mm -hmm. Shirk mm -hmm. is when you make a partner with the oneness of God. And when you have an intention to do something that is for anything other than God, you are committing a form of shirk. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, even, even good things, even trying to serve people and help people has its limitations when it's not done for the sake of God, because 
you end up in a cycle of trying to please people. I mean, people, uh, your teacher who taught you about uh, healing, his first thing was like, if you came into this to heal people, you're in the wrong business. Like this is not about- you, you, It's not the, about the people. Yeah, the, the results the are not in your hands at the end of the day. And the work has to be consistent and for something, and the only way it can stay consistent is if it's not reliant on temporal beings. And that actually is a really, that's a good point, because one thing I was mentioning last week was about a mother who called me who was in distress about decisions she made for her son's life that haven't panned out the way she wanted them to. And I asked her, I said, what were your intentions? She said, well, my intentions were sincere, but I made the wrong choice. And, you know, she was like, kind of so many waves of guilt were overcoming her. And um, when we really think about it, though, and I, and I told her, when you really sit with this, you have to realize that you actually ultimately were not in control because all you, you're not going to be held accountable for your son's actions as an adult. You will be held accountable for your intentions as you raped him. Mm -hmm. Were your intentions to raise your son so that other people can look at you and see that you're a good mother? I'm not saying that that was her intentions. I'm just bringing this up as a open-ended question to think about this as a general case study. Were your intentions so that your child can love Allah? And then go deeper. Are your intentions for your child to love Allah so that other people can look at you as a good parent? Or is it because you love Allah so much that you want your progeny to love Allah? And um, there is, there is a, something to be said about our desire to worship out of this love mm -hmm. and how that even our intentions, like even our intentions can be noble and um, acceptable, but they can still color everything about our actions. So my favorite quote that I always teach to my, um, my younger uh, mentor, mentees um, when I teach Halakha is the quote by Imam Ali. And he says, there are those who worship God. There are, there, there are those who worship God who are desirous of his reward. And so is the worship of the trader, one who trades. And there are those who worship God out of fear of his punishment. And so is the worship of the slave. And there are those who worship God out of love. And so is the worship of the free. So these are intentions that are technically acceptable. If you worship God just because you really want Jannah, you want paradise, you want all the, the beautiful promises that God has promised in the afterlife, that's acceptable. If you're worshiping because you're terrified of the concept of being punished in an afterlife and you're, you're staying straight on the, on the path for that reason, that's also acceptable. But the worship of the free is the one who does it purely out of love. Um, that reminds me of this kind of problem that we face, which is that intentions are, they're all over the place. <laughs> like they're, they're just not singular. Um, and it's constant struggle to try and bring them back to that singularity really. Um, and one of the things that I think is, is, oh, there's this amazing documentary. Oh, I'm not sure what platform it's on, but, uh, where it talks about people lying and people's justification for different types of lies and crimes. Um, and it's amazing to understand that everyone thinks they're doing the right thing. Everyone has the justification for what they're doing. Uh, even some heinous crimes are like, how could you justify that? And they'll share with you their justification. Like, oh, I can actually, yeah, that kind of makes sense in your worldview and in your understanding. Uh, there was also a CIA agent who mentioned that um, in all of her interviews and encounters with people who were violent terrorists or people who were um, double agents and traffickers and criminals and she was like, everyone thinks they're the good guy. And that's where your intention has been so muddled up 
uh, where it's no longer really a, like a really good example of this is uh, a documentary on lying um, where you will literally see I'll, I'll find the title for it I'll share it in, in the notes at some point but you see people's justifications for it and it brings to mind this idea that the devil doesn't get you to sign on the dotted line he gets you to make a series of negotiations mm -hmm. small negotiations bit by bit mm -hmm. that eventually you end up doing things that you can't really justify, i.e. Jeff Bezos and like the treatment of Amazon workers. There's no justification for that, but I'm sure he has one. And I'm sure there's a way he can sleep at night. Um, and mm -hmm. I would also like to um, mention that like, okay, if actions are by intentions, right? And these people who are doing heinous acts are justifying what they're doing how does this person get back on track? And I really believe that if your intentions are sincere for the sake of Allah, you will get sign after sign after sign that you're doing the wrong thing if you're doing the wrong thing. So it will be made clear. There's some practical steps as well um, that I thought about. Mm. Um, and it is about paying attention to the signs that you're saying. Mm. Exactly. Mm. Staying vigilant, super vigilant of what your where your intentions are are there any added bonuses or benefits to, to what you're getting are there any extra perks that you're like mm -hmm. yeah i'm doing it for this reason but you know but it's also kind of nice to get praise it's also kind of nice to get that extra bonus at work or whatever and, and, and so it's, it's not bad to feel good about those things but be hyper aware of those because that that's where the devil gets you to make a little negotiation that can end up down a series of because of your it's, it initially starts with your nefs. So, like I mentioned last week, your nefs is uh, a loose translation is ego, right? And your nefs has two goals only: to avoid pain and to seek pleasure. It doesn't matter what like doesn't matter if it's ethical, unethical, whatever. That's all your nefs wants, and to be. Muslim is to constantly fight against your nafs and rise above it for what you know your soul believes is the right thing to do to attain closeness and nearness and divine intimacy to, to the one God. Mm -hmm. And if your nafs is enjoying something that was the side effect of a noble intention you got to keep your nefs under check because your nefs might start really liking the praise, for example, right? And then the devil works with your nefs like, oh, it's so nice to get that compliment. You can do this thing because then you'll really get praise for it. All of a sudden, your intention has shifted entirely. Mm -hmm. Now you're doing this new action. You're, you're furthering your, your behavior of noble deeds, but not for Allah anymore. It's for the prospect of, ooh, wait till they see how good I am at X. Mm -hmm. um, there's something that comes to mind that has been super helpful for me to uh, practically speaking in this, which is that staying vigilant is not always possible without the additional tool of a pen and paper. Like actually like writing down things because mm -hmm. once it's on paper, once you ask yourself why, and you put that those words on paper, you can actually see them and analyze them. And when you ask why, ask why to the answer you just wrote. Mm. So if you write, why am I doing X? And you give an answer. Well, why that answer? And then see how far you can keep asking why. Because the reality is we sometimes aren't even aware of our own selves, our own foods. Like, that's why the subconscious is called subconscious. You have your conscious awareness of something and then you have your subconscious that where you bury shame or denial or, you know, last week I talked about shame. So if you haven't seen that talk, um, please check on um, the Facebook for that talk about that because it's, it's super, super important to linking these two concepts, but shame can end up controlling you on a subconscious level and you don't realize it because we will deny certain realities and deny self-awareness because we might find deep discomfort in the shame. 
So yeah, writing things down is an amazing tool for self-awareness and self-awareness can only happen if you're truly honest with yourself. I'm, I'm also a big um, advocate for uh, psychological therapy. I think it's super important um, because you can find things about your intentions that you never realized. You can find that you were doing things you, where you thought you were doing them from a place of duty or love. And in fact, it was from a place of anxiety or it was from a place of fear. Mm -hmm. um, and that's a very interesting thing to, to realize. Um, so one thing I wanted to say as well before uh, we wrap up is that this, this is work. It's, it's not easy. It's not supposed to be easy. Life is like a life well lived is uncomfortable. It's comfortably <laughs> uncomfortable. Comfortably uncomfortable. It's that balance between the two. Growth only happens when you're comfortably uncomfortable. And something uh, that I think is important to mention though, is that we're going to make mistakes and we're going to continue to do things and have our intentions messed up, but we can't beat ourselves up about it. When we <laughs> notice that we have a bad intention, it is super important to recognize it and then just change it. It's, it's not complicated. Mm -hmm. It's not like, Oh my God, I did all this for that. And just realign yourself back onto the direction, onto the path, the straight path, whatever it might be to have the soundest heart that you can, as you kind of move, move forward. There's a, there's a hadith that I use as like my creative license. So I'm not paralyzed um, into being afraid to do anything because I'm making the wrong mistakes or because it's coming from an impure place. Um, the creative license, Hadith, I call it, uh, goes like this. By him in whose hands is my soul, if you did not sin, Allah will replace you. He would replace you with people who would sin and they would seek forgiveness from Allah and he would forgive them. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Read that again. <laughs> By him whose hand is, is my soul. If you did not sin, Allah will replace you with people who would sin and they would seek forgiveness from Allah and he would forgive them. That's in Sahih Muslim. Um, I think that's what we are made to do. That, and that's your, that's your creative license. That's your, hey, you're going to mess up. It's not too com complicated, but you need to stay vigilant of your intentions along the way. And as long as you constantly realign your intentions, there shouldn't be anything holding you back. And doing it is very simple. It's a, sim it's a simple moment with yourself and God where you go, oh, my intention was this. Allah, please forgive me. I've wronged myself. I've wronged myself because not because I've wronged, I've wronged Allah, I've wronged myself because I've robbed myself of divine intimacy with an insincere intention, right? So you just have this moment with yourself and go, okay, my intention is for you, Allah, and thank you for showing me that and for bringing me back to you. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, that's that. Let's wrap. <laughs>